Hello, and welcome to our worship service here at Lamb Peter Church of the Brethren, where our mission is to know God, love others, and serve the world. I'm Josh Marcroft, the youth director here at Lamb Peter, and we're so thankful that you could join us this morning. I wanted to extend a special welcome to all the dads on this Father's Day. We are so grateful and cherish the work that you have done, are doing, and continue to do in the lives of your children. I wanted to take a moment to recognize those who made this week's service possible, starting with Doug Hallman and his efforts to produce it, Dennis Emmert for reading scripture, and Tony Phillips and Mark Malley for their service on the worship team this week. There is a digital bulletin for the service with follow-up questions that we encourage you to read as a family or in a small group. This can be found in the description or in the comments. There's also a Sunday school class every Sunday at 11 a.m. with me to dive deeper into the sermon and just find out what it has for us. The spring new members class just concluded, but if you want to sign up or be a member for the fall term, you can sign up via lampheatercob at lampcob.com. Finally, we want to thank you for your generosity during this pandemic. It allows us as a church to continue to be salt and light in a community that so desperately needs Jesus Christ. We thank you for your generosity. Now will you reflect on Psalm 52 as I read it aloud. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all the words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name for it is good in the presence of of the godly. Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you a needy people. We recognize that we in and of ourselves are insufficient and frail. The only thing permanent is you and your word, and we desire to cling to that especially in these moments of tribulation and trial. I thank you for the opportunity to meet this past Wednesday in an outdoor worship setting. It is so good to gather with the people of God, and it is a reminder of the bond that we share as a church family. Satan seeks to isolate so that we might fall to sin, but when we are together, We are strengthened by one another, by the power of the Spirit, and by the Word. I thank you for Chris and the leadership team and the deacons for their work to lead this church in this pandemic and in this time of uncertainty. But we trust that they are trusting in you for a vision that allows us to continue to be the church. I pray that we as a church would continue to serve our community through the food bank, through prayer, through sharing the gospel, the gospel of Christ. This is the one thing that can save. We thank you for the gift of Christ, and we yearn for the day that he will return and make all things right. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We've asked some of the kids to put together something for Father's Day. We hope you enjoy.
Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Daddy. Yes, Daddy. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. I love you. Say Happy Father's Day. I love you, Daddy. <laughs> happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for all you do, Dad. You're the best. We love, love you. you. Happy Father's Day. Daddy, I hope you have a great Father's Day. You're the best dad in the world. Hi, hi. Happy Father's Day, Pat. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. We love you. You're the best. Together, Lord, bind us 
us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Greetings to you all. I'm Dennis Emmert from Brethren Village. I will be reading the scripture today from Acts 2, verse 41 through 47. Those who accept this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and their goods, they gave to anyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people together. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, welcome to Lampeter Church of the Brethren's online worship service. My name is Chris Shelley. I'm the lead pastor here at Lampeter, where our mission is to help people to know God, to love others, and to serve the world. And over the last eight or nine weeks, we've been studying the book of Colossians. And we've been studying how Jesus is supreme. And at the end of every one of those messages, we have called you to be the church. And so we thought right now, now is the time to talk about what it means to be the church. What does scripture tell us the church looked like when it started? What was the mission of Jesus' followers as he departed them here on earth? What was the mission when the Spirit came to the church and how they were supposed to look and what they did and how they lived their lives? And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. So before we dive into that, though, I invite you to pray with me as we invite the Holy Spirit in to help the text come to life in our hearts and our minds. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you do, for calling us to yourself, to, for sending your son into this world to die for our sins, to pay the price for our wrongs, and then to do so by death on the cross, and then to rise again, giving us hope of a future life with you. Lord, if we look at this text, we know it comes from you. And so we ask for eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. That we would study this word and it would move us, convict us, and affirm in us who you are and how we're to live our lives. And so, Lord, I just ask that all of our hearts and minds would be open to receiving your word today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to give you a few statistics about the church. I mean, if we're going to talk about the church today, we probably should look at where the church has been and how they've gotten to where we are today. And so one of the things that you can do is look at a longitudinal study. Now, a longitudinal study is a study that looks at statistics over a period of time. Barna Research Group, they have looked at church trends over several decades. And so they just published a study here in March. And in March, they said that currently, those who identify as practicing believers, and that qualifies in three ways. One, they affirm that they are a Christian. Two, that they believe their faith is important for their everyday life. And three, that they have attended church in the last month. So those who claim to be practicing 
believers of Christianity. They said the overall population uh, was about one in four. Now, if you look at the same question asked back in 2000, so we're looking at 20 years ago, two decades ago, the number was 45%. 45% of those asked if they were a practicing believer said, yes, they're a practicing believer. They, they're a Christian, that they believe that their faith is important for their everyday life, and they've attended church in the last month. And so what we see in 20 years is a 20% drop, right? Between 45% 20 years ago to 25% now. For us, it's kind of like looking at half of our congregations exiting the church, right? If we had 45 people in 2000 and now we only had 25 people in 2020, that's about half of the church. Now I want to contrast that with another number that it's called the rise of the nuns when you look at research and it's kind of a funny term and no we're not talking about convent nuns we're talking about those who affiliate with zero religious organizations the rise of the nuns are those who are agnostic or those who are atheists that don't believe um, or have left the church and that number in 2013 was uh, t- was 11 percent And in 2018, that number has doubled or nearly doubled to 21%. And so there's a lot of things that can be said and looked at about what that says about the church. There's a lot of fingers being pointed as why this is. But I can tell you what this has done. I mean, over the years, the church has has dumped just tons of money into advertising, into commercials and signs and, and taking cues from their secular partners of how to do business, how to do church like a business. And so they've done things to become more attraction oriented and consumeristic. And they've done that to fill seats. And so you can have your own opinions about what you think the church is doing if it's just filling seats. But I would say that filling seats is not the only measure. It's not a terrible measure, but not the only measure that needs to be taken when we look at church growth, because we also know that many of our false teachers in America today have some of the largest churches in America. So how did it get this way? What has happened? And I know that some people are saying, well, you know what, it's the Bible. The Bible has become outdated. And I would argue that it's not that the Bible has become outdated. It's that we, as the church, have not taken the Bible seriously enough. It's that we as the Bible, we as the church have looked at the Bible and we've said, you know what, it's it's too old. It's too irrelevant. And you know what? We can also see in these same statistics from Barna Research Group that in the same two decades, that readership of the Bible has gone down. The biblical literacy, those who are staying in the word and reading the word and studying it, that's also gone down significantly in the last 20 years. And so today we are far less literate about what's in the Bible than ever before. And again, we can point fingers. Here's what I have said years ago, and here's what I'm saying still today, that what we're seeing is a decline, but what we are seeing is the emergence of the true church, the church that's always been there, the ones who have been called according to his purpose, the ones who have received his spirit, those are the ones that are emerging today. It's the true church that's been there from the beginning, and the people that are leaving are those that are considered by researchers and scholars to be nominal Christians, those who they were social Christians. They were there because it's where their friends were. They were there because it was fun. Um, they were there because, you know, it was like the secular world, but included Jesus, right? So that is a social American church. And so I think what we're seeing is people are saying, you know what, this never changed my life anyway. This was just something to do to hang out. And it was important, but it wasn't important enough to become a priority. It was like the word of God was important, but not enough to change my life. 
And it was like organized religion, being with the body of Christ was important, but not important enough as to be a priority over all the other things that you're doing in your life. So what we're going to look at is this text, Acts 2, verses 41 through 47, and we're going to look at how the early church lived their lives. And I think we, as the church, we have to say, why was this written? Why did Luke include this text, right? If he didn't mean it, if he didn't want us to look at it. So let's look at it. It says, so verse 41, he says, so then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. All right. So he begins with, so then. Well, then we better look at what is this about? If you look back at verse 38 with me, Peter is preaching to the Jews during the Passover. He's, he's preaching to them. And, and there's this time called the Pentecost. Okay. And Peter's preaching. And he says, repent. And each of one of you should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for those who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So in verse 41, when Luke says, so then, he's talking about all of those who heard the message of what Jesus had done, were convicted, they were cut to the heart, and then they felt that they needed to repent. So those who repented of their sins, and that means to turn away from the wrong ways of doing life. That means turning towards the way Jesus has lived his life and what God calls us to do. Those who responded this way were baptized and 3,000 were added that day. I mean, that had to be an incredible moment. In verse 42, he says, this is what they looked like. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Right? And so these are three of the things, four of the things that we ask our house churches and groups here at Lamp Peter to do. This needs to be a part of how you interact and have community. Not because it's a mandate, but it's because this is what the early disciples, this is what the early followers saw as important ways of life. One, they followed the teachings. And for us, the teachings could be your elders, they could be the pastors, and there's the word of God and studying the word of God. And then number two, the second thing that they did was, well, they broke bread. I, you might have a long history of big discussions happening around the, 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 minute, the dinner table, right? For, for me, that was where serious conversation took place. There's something about being at the dinner table and around food where deep conversation occurs. And there, I don't know if there's a logic to it. But it just seems to be the place where that kind of thing happens. And the disciples saw it important that they would also break bread and have dinner and have a meal with each other. And the next thing that they did was they had prayer, right? They, they prayed with one another and for one another. They prayed for those who didn't hear the gospel yet, but are going to soon hear the gospel. And they had a mission to go and meet them where they were. Verse 43, he says, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles, right? Because the, the feeling and the sense was that God was with them, that the spirit was present in the home and what he was doing in and among them and through their families and through their workplaces. And so they're sharing these stories. This is what God has done. This is what the spirit is doing among us and in the workplace and in our families. And again, this is why here at Lampeter, we, we want to have a focus on sharing personal testimonies of what God has done. And you'll hear that on Wednesdays 
And when we have started our outdoor worship service, we are inviting people to come and share the testimony of what God has done and has provided for them during this pandemic. Verse 44, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Right? So like these groups that are meeting in their homes that are studying the word and listening to the disciples teaching and they're breaking bread and they're praying with one another. They're also looking at the those that are among them and if anybody has any need, they make sure that somebody doesn't go without. Right? It, it's... They're sharing their, their monetary wealth. They're sharing their possessions with one another so that everyone has what they need. They're, they're living this communal life where if I have a need, you're going to meet my needs. And if, if you have a need, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that you are taken care of. But I do want you to hear something here because... There could be this sense that, okay, so what Jesus was calling his disciples to do and now Luke is describing in this church is, I mean, I guess I have to sell everything. I mean, I, I guess it looks like I have to give all my possessions away. And that's, you have to understand something here that, that being poor does not equal being a Christian, right? You don't have to go broke to become a good Christian. It was like, if I saw that my best friend or my brother in Christ here at the church was suffering or was struggling, I was gonna make sure that his family was taken care of. And I was gonna do what I needed to do to make sure that they were taken care of. That means maybe providing meals. That means maybe giving money to make sure that they could pay or buy whatever they needed. It means that we as a community would come around them and support them in those ways. And that's how they live their lives. Right? It's not, you don't have to go broke to be a Christian. And I know some people believe that. Some people believe they have to sell everything and just be totally broke to be a Christ follower. And I don't think that's what's being taught here. And I think we need to just be careful because that turns this whole thing into a works-based faith. And we already know that that is a heresy. We're not, we don't believe in a works-based faith. We believe in grace through faith alone. So they were selling their possessions to make sure anyone had need. And this does come from what Jesus said. You know, in, in Luke 12, verses 33 and 34, Jesus does ask his followers to give up their possessions. He does ask them to sell and give to the poor. In Luke 18, he also um, calls the rich young ruler out and says, you know what? The one thing that you lack, the one thing that you lack is to sell your possessions because he knew that in that rich young ruler's heart of hearts that money was his God. And so if we look at this, I just want you to think with me because I had this question. We're like, what if this is serious? What I mean, what if, why is this here unless they actually meant you should live this way? I want you to look at verse 40 because Peter says, be saved from this perverse generation. See, what is happening is they are creating a culture within a culture. They're creating a way of life that's far different than the other way of life. They are separating themselves from the secular and they're trying to make themselves separate. That's called sacred. And so Peter says, you need to be saved from this perverse generation. And so you have to think of what did the early, what did Rome look like that first century? What kinds of things that they had? Polytheism? You know, so... They did things to separate themselves from the rest of the world. You know, there were ways that they lived their life that was communal where the rest of the world may not have been. So we need to think about that today. How do we as believers, and as the church, how do we get back to some of these things? How do we learn to live in a community, to be set apart from the rest of the world? How do we look at ourselves and say, okay, you know, God has called us to live a life that's different. He's been doing that since Israel 
Israel was a nation set apart from all other nations. And now we are the church, the true church today, called to be set apart from all the others out there. Separate. And so it says, day by day, verse 46, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, this is great. This is great because what we see in verse 47 is a tie back to verse 41. Verse 46 and 47, tying back to verse 41, you see this idea of day by day. This is telling us how they met. They didn't just meet on Sundays. All right, that wasn't good enough. They, they got together. They called one another if it was 2020, right? They would have gotten the phone. They met day after day after day because the way they understood what Jesus had called them to do, it was a life-changing, life-shaping way of life that was set apart from the rest of the world. And they were called to live this way daily, not just weekly. It's wild. And so my, my mind is blown by this. And, and we have to ask, why is this so hard? I mean, why do we struggle with this? This is here for a reason. It's here for a purpose. This text is here to move us and affirm in us what the church is supposed to look like and convict us and say, how do we get there? So I think part of it is this idea of day by day and continually. Words like that tell us that the church did not just meet on Sunday, but they met Monday through Saturday as well. They were connected. They lived in true community with one another. They believed what Jesus had said, and it changed the way they lived their lives. We would say that Ecclesiology, it's the study of the church, leads to their missiology. It's the study of the mission. It's how they live. And so it's how they function that they've taken from Jesus and their way of life and the way Jesus lived his life. How they function has led them to be on mission, to reach out. Because you see, thousands are added to their number day by day. I mean, what an awesome revival is what we would call that, is people coming back to the Lord, their hearts being changed for the sake of the gospel. But I want you, and I want myself, I'm talking to myself here, I want us to look at this and say, and ask the question, you know, isn't this, I mean, this is serious. What if we actually followed it? Right? Critics of the, the Bible would say that the problem with Christianity is the Bible, and I would say that we're not taking it seriously enough. So what if we actually did what it said? What if we actually followed it? And so that's, that's why for these, these next couple of weeks, we're going to look at these things. But I want you to add these things to your list, that when you gather, would you study the Word? That's what it means to be the church. That when you gather... Would you fellowship and break bread with one another? Because that's what it means to be the church. When you gather, would you pray? I mean, prayerfulness is one of those things that is severely lacking in the church in America today. Is that something that we do here at Lampeter? We have some awesome prayer warriors here at Lampeter. But when you gather, would you pray with one another and for one another? Because that's what it means to be the church. And the next thing is when, you, when you're looking at the world around you, it's your family, your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, and they have a need, would you allow your group to invest in them, to reach out to them so that you might impact them with the love of Christ, that they would hear the gospel through you and through your actions, that they might respond positively to the good news of the gospel. Because that's what it means to be the church. That our understanding of who the church is is not the building, but it's the people. 
and that the people would go and be on mission. The church, we should stop doing a come and see, come and see mentality. And we need to move more into a go and tell. I mean, that's how Jesus functioned and that's how he led. But so much of the church in America today is just a come and see, come and see type church. Got banners, signs, commercials, advertisements. That's not what the church was. And that's not who the church is. The church is the people. And so what if the church, just what if, was less about come here, come see what we're doing, and instead was about go and tell the world? One of the favorite things that's been happening at my house has been happening on the children's front. My daughter has been witnessing to our neighbor, and it's super adorable and beautiful to watch. She's been reaching out and and telling her neighbor about Jesus. She's been singing songs about Jesus, songs from Vacation Bible School, songs from her Sunday school class, and she really misses church. And she's been doing that, and of course now her neighbor is trying to learn the songs. They're like the same age. They're basically the same child. So they're trying to learn the songs, and she's teaching her, and you know she's telling her all these things about Jesus. And then the other day, this child's grandma tells us, you know, I really appreciate what your daughter is doing because our family doesn't go to church and I would really like it if they did. So I don't know how to talk to her, but I really appreciate that your daughter is. And it's just this like glowing moment as a parent to be watching this unfold and be like, you know what, I think my, my daughter gets it better than I do sometimes. You know, for, for her, it's no problem because it's simple. Who we are as believers and the most loving thing that we can do with our friends and the people that we love is introduce them to Jesus. It is the most loving thing that we can do because it is, is the only thing that gives them true hope. And so when we ask you to be the church, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at Acts 2. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 10 and later John 4. This is what it means to be the church. And so we ask you, what if Luke was serious? What if Jesus was serious? And what if this is what the church is supposed to look like? So let me ask you right now, can you be the church? Will you be the church? And if you've never heard this before, then I invite you to pray with me now. Because you say, you look at this and you're like, I want a community like this. And I'm not getting this from the world. I'm not getting this from my team. I want a community like this. Then I'm going to ask you to invite Jesus into your heart. And then I'm going to ask that you connect with us here at Lamp Peter. So would you pray with me now as we do that? Father, we thank you for sending your son into this world to giving us uh, an example of how to live and, and what true community looks like. And so, Lord, we, we confess that we have gotten away from that way of life. We have been drawn into a very secular way of life and a very isolated way of life and a very individualistic way of life. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just draw us back into your presence, draw us back into community with our brothers and sisters. And I ask, Lord, if there's anyone that's hearing this message today that has never experienced this kind of community, has never experienced this kind of hope and peace, that they would ask Jesus into their hearts today and that they would follow up by connecting with us. Lord, for the rest of us here at Lampeter in this church, as we look and reflect on our own lives, we just ask that you draw us back into this way of life, that you... Bring us back into community with one another because we've just gotten sucked into our everyday secular lives and things within the church have become less a priority. Scripture has become less a priority. Prayer has become less a priority. And so we confess that we are not doing that well. We repent of those sins and mistakes and we ask that you draw us back into your presence through your spirit. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. song we 
could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. You open up my eyes. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every Every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up. Church, I miss you deeply, and I want to say thanks on behalf of the staff and the leadership team. Thank you so much. Throughout this pandemic, you have remained consistent, and uh, you, your generous support and your letters um, have been impactful to our lives. It's been an encouragement to us to read those and to receive those, and then we share them with one another um, as we get them. 
because we want everyone to be encouraged during this time. It's very easy while we're all separated to feel like we are being isolated. And, and, I, and I want to just prepare you and warn you that that is an attack on the body of Christ, that as we are separated from one another, it is a way um, of, of darkness, of evil to get in there and make everyone feel like they're being personally isolated, that they're being divided, they're being separated. And, and so I think we see that in our world and I think we see that even in the church today. We want you to be encouraged and we appreciate so much your letters of encouragement here at the church that what we're doing is helping in some way, but we want you to know that we are trying our best to keep everyone connected as we do um, the videos and we have started the outdoor worship services. And so I invite you, that's the next thing I wanna say, as I invite you on Wednesday evenings to come on out so that we may gather for a time of prayer and worship. There's never a time we shouldn't be praying, but it does seem that in our world right now, it needs prayer and that we need prayer and that we need to come together united around one front and to pray for our world. And so I invite you, Wednesday evenings, right now at 6.30 p.m. here on the property outside, we are gathering for some time of prayer and worship. And we invite you to come and be a part of that so that we can come around and fight this through prayer. The next thing I wanna invite you to do is, if this is the first time that you're connecting with us at Lampeter, and something that's been said or something that you heard or seen today has made an impact on you and, and you wanna know what your next step is, then we invite you to jump into a class, a follow-up study with Josh Marcroft. There will be a Zoom class following this class. It's 11 a.m. Sunday mornings, 11 a.m. Sunday mornings, there's a follow-up class with Josh Marcroft. I invite you to take part in that. If your next step is you wanna become a member here at Lampeter, we just finished the new members class, but we will begin again in the fall. And so if you wanna register, there'll be an email link in the announcements following the benediction. And so we invite you to register for that class, get your name in there so that we can have you all ready to go and have the things that you need to start that class. And so the last thing I want to say to you is the thing that we've been saying from the beginning. The building is not the church. You are the church. We want you to be the church. So that means make those phone calls, connect with your brothers and sisters, reach out to those in need. I know many of you will hopefully be gathering together in some kind of house church model following the, the four principles that were laid out today and will be laid out in the next couple weeks. So we ask that you do that, get together, pray with one another that you would make phone calls, write those cards to your neighbors. And if you see a need, that you'll meet that need. And so we invite you to continue to be the church.
officially inviting you to Camp Out Bible School. We'll be hosting this event live on both Facebook and YouTube. So mark your calendars for July 20th through 24th at six in the evening. And we look forward to camping out with you this summer.